Welcome you once again to our study of the Book of Mormon. Our study today will consist of 2 Nephi chapters 1 and 3. Chapter 2 will be dealt with uh, by itself uh, in a separate segment. Uh, my name is Robert Millett. I'm a member of the Department of Ancient Scripture, and I'm happy to be joined today by three of my favorite people, uh, Thomas Wayment, Victor Ludlow, and Stanley Johnson, all members of that same Department of Ancient Scripture. Gentlemen and brethren, uh, let's, let's segue from our, our last discussion, if we can, into this one by, by turning to uh, chapter 22 and make a quick comment. Tom, if you would, bring us from, bring us from where we've come down to the last verse uh, and lead us into 2 Nephi. What Nephi's just done at the end of the end of 1 Nephi is he's given us bits and pieces from Isaiah. He's given us Zenic, Zenus, and, and showed us how many people have prophesied of the Messiah. And now what he's going to do is conclude that and turn to his father's words in particular. Why don't you go ahead for us, if you will, and read verse 31 of the, this is 1 Nephi 22. Wherefore, you need not suppose that I and my father are the only ones that have testified and also taught them. Wherefore, if ye shall be obedient to the commandments and endure to the end, ye shall be saved at the last day. And thus it is. Amen. Pretty good summary, isn't it? Keep the commandments, endure to the end. I mean, it doesn't get any. In the words of Elder Ballard, we need to keep the commandments until we're safely dead. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And so we move into 2 Nephi, the second book of Nephi. And uh, we'll do a little bit of history here, but by chapter 5, we're going to run out of story, and it'll be pure doctrine, won't it? Mm -hmm. uh, so that when Nephi was told, occupy these plates with sacred things by the Lord, he, he takes that seriously. Yeah, but I mean, earlier when he talked about the, the plates and these plates, he said it's, it's the ministry and the prophecies. And so that's what we're really going to be hitting. More so in this than chapter. anything in, in, in Second I mean, Nephi. This whole book. That's yes. right. We notice in verse 4 of Second Nephi 1 that Jerusalem has been destroyed. So, what year do we fix this at, uh, Victor? It's got to be after 586. Okay, sometime after 586. Uh, but in spite of that, verse 5, he reminds us we have obtained a land of promise, a land which is choice above all other lands a land which the Lord God hath covenanted with me should be a land for the inheritance of my seed. Yea, the Lord hath covenanted this land unto me and to my children forever, and also all those who should be led out of other countries by the hand of the Lord. Let's remind ourselves of the fact that, that when you speak of the scattering of Israel, most of the time Israel is scattered when she proves disobedient, when they reject the Messiah, when they reject the gospel. But there's a positive dimension to scattering, and that's when the Lord on purpose moves individuals or groups of people to different parts of the world, as he did with the Lehite colony, to uh, fulfill that Abrahamic covenant, to make that influence everywhere. And as kind of a as they are leavening among the Gentiles, I think it could, we could also include not only that mixed Gentile, Israelite, scattered mix in Europe or wherever they're at, but other groups. I mean, we, we know after the Lehi groups come that we've got the Mulekites. Uh, later, of course, we know Spanish, Portuguese, and others, the mm -hmm. Puritans. Uh, I, I think there's even a, a justification here that none are brought to this land saved by the hand of the Lord, even under maybe not the most friendly of circumstances, as yes. indentured servants or as slaves. Yes. They're still brought to this land 
where they have an opportunity to be a part of a marvelous nation if they so choose, and that's what he highlights in the next verses. What, in fact, if we were to look ahead and go to chapter 10, I think it is, what other promise do we get? Not only that the Lord's watching out for this land, but he says something else. Well, there be no kings in this land, or shall be no kings. There shall be no kings in this land. That's a very important uh, promise. We, we get a feeling for the fact the Lord's not excited about wicked kings, and he's a little nervous about kings in general, unless that king really is Christ. Um, and so, in these opening chapters, Lehi is sort of bidding goodbye, because we know that by chapter 4, he will leave us. But uh, let, let's pick up, if we can, in, in chapter 1 of Second Nephi, with uh, verse 13. Um, Stan, would you start us off there? He's trying to speak us particularly. You can see him pleading with those, those rebellious sons in particular. Start us off in 13, and if you will, read through 15. Okay. Oh, that ye would awake, awake from the deep sleep, yea, even from the sleep of hell, and shake off the awful chains by which ye are bound, which are the chains which bind the children of men that they are carried away captive down to the eternal gulf of misery and woe, and awake and arise from the dust, and hear the words of a trembling parent, whose limbs ye must soon lay down in the cold and silent grave, from whence no traveler can return. A few more days and I go the way of all earth. But behold, the Lord hath redeemed my soul from hell. I have beheld his glory, and I am encircled about eternally in the arms of his love. Let's talk for a moment about this, this concept of awake, the, 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 the pleading on his part, awake, awake. He'll do it again in verse 23, awake, my sons, put on the armor of righteousness. What is he trying to get across, Vic, from your, your point of view? Well, I think there's a couple of things, of course. First of all, he's grabbing our attention, saying this is important. But there's also some imagery he uses here. In verse 13, he talks about the chains which bind the children of man. Uh, the allusions in verse 14 to the, the, the bondage of death and on all of this. But the Lord can redeem our souls in verse 15. And then jumping ahead to verse 23, where awake again, but how to be rescued from all of this? Put on the armor of righteousness. They're both heavy metal, chains and armor, but chains restrict you where armor protects you That's and you're good. still mobile. But if you cross-reference this to uh, later here, uh, Jacob in Second Nephi 9, verse 14, he tells us, if you'll keep wearing this armor of righteousness, there's a time you can exchange that for robes. Of righteousness, much lighter, much more comfortable, especially <laughs> on a you know on a cold winter day or whatever. But there are times when we need to wear the armor of righteousness. So wake up, pay attention here. These are things that are absolutely important for you to remember. I think too there there's an experience he's trying to portray to them. In the one, there's a captivity, as Vic said, you know, being chained down, tied up. And then he says, but I've experienced a freedom, being loved and encircled, redeemed. And I, I think what he wants them to, to see is what you're experiencing, the anger, the frustration in the family. Compare that to what I have. And notice in verse 15 in particular, he uses past tense verbs. I have been redeemed. I have beheld his glory. And I am now encircled. Wouldn't you want to be that way? Awake, look what I've got. Look what Nephi has, this joy we experience. You know what I think of, too? That's beautiful, Tom. And I, and I think, too, of this. Even This is a message that even the most faithful, righteous individual needs to hear regularly, which is, do you remember years ago, President, Hink, uh, President Kimball said to the saints, we have paused on some plateaus long enough. That, that just haunts me because what it says to me is that there's a, we make spiritual progress and we rise to a spiritual plateau. And if, we're, if we really are in tune and the Spirit is with us, we, we're only going to stay there so long before the Spirit starts nudging. Move along. Move along. Or move up. Move up a little. And, and, and I think if, if there is a disease with which we're afflicted in this complex day in the 21st century, it isn't, it's the obvious sins, of course, that are out there all about us, but it's also the sins of distraction and preoccupation. Mm -hmm. 
that keep us from enjoying the kind of spiritual union that Lehi enjoyed so beautifully there by being encircled eternally in the arms of his love. I was thinking of uh, one thing, and I'll get your comment on this, Stan. Uh, the sixth section of the Doctrine and Covenants is an awfully good cross-reference to this. Let me just turn to it for us and read this to you. Look at this, this language. Um, Behold, thou art Oliver, section 6, verse 20, and I have spoken unto thee because of thy desires. Therefore, treasure up these words in thy heart. Be faithful and diligent in keeping the commandments of God. And there it is again. And I will encircle thee in the arms of my love. Yeah. That, that motif of atonement that we know of as embrace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lehi has obviously experienced that. Now, maybe it's a little bit of uh, some kind of spiritual affirmation that his mission is about to finish and the Lord has accepted it. God, is, God has accepted his offering. Yeah, and, and he's, he's kind of d d given his last word and testimony, as so many of the prophets do, but it's with peace. It's, he, he feels that love, even though he may not be getting the, all the positive feedback from some of his yeah. sons, he knows he's done his part. This is what I would call in spite of a hopeless world in many cases, he is a man that lives in hope, hope in Christ. Stan, you I, I was just recalling Elder Nelson's talk uh, in conference where he talked about kafar and kafat. Uh -huh. And uh, the word kafat uh, was, an, if I remember correctly, meant a full embrace. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what the One of the definitions is. of atone. Atone mm -hmm. is, is a full embrace. And uh, I, I think when we have those moments in our life where, you know, it comes at different times when we know the Lord's pleased and we feel that full embrace. And, and I think his concern here in one is, boys, you're not giving that same embrace back. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I think we're afraid for whatever reason, maybe that uh, the Lord isn't uh, as good at giving us the embrace that the world can give us, so that we're afraid to give him a full embrace. Uh, I think that's, that's well said. Vic, read for us, if you will, verse 21 of uh, 2 Nephi 1. And now that my soul might have joy in you, and that my heart might leave this world with gladness because of you, that I might not be brought down with grief and sorrow to the grave, Arise from the dust, my sons, and be men, and be determined in one mind and in one heart, united in all things, that ye may not come down into captivity. Isn't that a fascinating phrase? They are already men, but what is he saying? Come on, boys. That's what he's really saying. Really be men now. Grow up. Yeah. Grow up spiritually. I mean, and that's a language Joseph Smith uses in the dedicatory prayer of the Kirtland Temple, where he says, uh, we'll grow up in the Holy Ghost. Uh, when when, when uh, Mormon wants to talk about how magnificent Nephi and Lehi, sons of Helaman, are, he says, they began to grow up in the Lord. Hmm. I think he even defines what he means by man following exactly what you've said. He says, be determined in one mind. That's a man, someone who's determined in the gospel, and one heart, and united. So, mm -hmm. so he really defines what he's after. It's not manliness or, you know, macho-ness. It's be united in the kingdom. That well, would it's, be it's, man. It's Jesus's, your eye ought to be single to the glory of God. And I was thinking of the Danish uh, philosopher Kierkegaard who said, purity of heart is to will one thing. Yeah, and see, obviously they're not having that unit because as he finishes the chapters, he has to berate a couple of his boys who are self-centered, misinterpreting the what they conceive to be the political ambition of their brother. And so he's, he's admonishing them, you can still pull together and, and do something with this if you'll just be humble, good men. Stan. I remember, too, I mean, I'm sure you were there, or at least heard it, when President Benson in priesthood meeting was speaking to the men and encouraging them to get married in the proper time, you know, within uh, the proper timeline, and he used these verses. And it, it's really a call to, uh, to be men of Christ. Yes. It's really a call to, uh, I'm thinking of the hymn, 
rise up, O men of God. And then the next line is just chilling. Have done with lesser things. Yeah. You know, put the, put the kid stuff away. Grow up, as Paul would say to the Corinthians, you know, time to grow up. Let's turn our attention to chapter three. A little, a little background on this one. Now, it seems to me that what we have here is Lehi talking now to his son, Joseph, the youngest. And so what does he do? He draws upon excerpts, if you will, a lengthier prophecy. What we would know is the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 50, mm -hmm. the prophecies of Joseph of old. But he draws upon excerpts from that prophecy and gives them directly to his son, Joseph. I'm going to quote to you from your namesake. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to mm -hmm. tell you what your namesake taught. And so this becomes a very, very important chapter. I'd like us to keep in mind, too, I've often wondered, what did Joseph Smith feel as he translated this oh, chapter? Oh, I've wondered the same thing, yes. What did yeah. he feel? Especially verse 15, where he <laughs> sees his name come into play. Oh, yeah, and his dad's name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's begin, let's begin if we can. Let's start with verses 6, 7, and 8. Tom, if you'll read those for us. For Joseph truly testified, saying, A seer shall the Lord my God raise up, who shall be a choice seer unto the fruit of my loins. Let's don't, let's don't go any further till we establish. Let's understand together at this point, what are we talking about when we, when we say a seer? Literally, it means one who sees, but it's a synonym for prophet, but it's one who sees the beginning from the end, and, okay. and the implication is they don't only see it, they help bring it into, into action. Uh, I guess it's later in uh, Mosiah, isn't it? Chapter 8, where we actually have, have uh, Ammon, uh, the king, crying out to Ammon, wow, a seer is greater than a prophet. And Ammon says, a seer is a prophet and a revelator also. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I was thinking of another definition in the sixth chapter of Moses where Enoch is given that very unusual exercise, go anoint your eyes with clay, wash it off now. And then it says Enoch then saw all the spirits that God had created and he saw things not visible to the natural eye. We, we sustain 15 men as prophets, seers and revelators and one of their great gifts uh, Elder Eyring once said to a group here, he said, prophets have a lousy sense of timing. They always want to talk about things before they come to pass. <laughs> and, and, and I've often thought, yes, thank heavens, that they can see around the corner, look down the road, and tell what's coming. They, they just, uh, they really, I, I love what you said, they see things we don't see. And uh, Who could have anticipated oh. the attacks upon the family in the early 1960s that we receiving, we've received in the last 20 years when the push came to whole family home evening, exactly. once again. You want me to give you a demonstration of that? Uh, my dissertation advisor out at Brandeis University uh, had a multi-year leave of absence, millions of dollars to study the, the American Jewish community, which is about the same size as the American LDS community. I happened to be visiting with him out in Boston and he talked about all these problems of the American Jewish community. And he said to me, Victor, we would love to have the problems you Mormons have. Uh, <laughs> trying to find everybody, you know, enough adults to go up to girls camp and with the scouts and all the churches we're building and, and all of these other things. But he talked particularly about some of these problems with the family and members feeling alienated. And so I suggested, well, if they, if they just don't feel like there's, you know, there's one rabbi and a, a hundreds of them in the congregation, why not have some of the elders of the congregation come out and mm -hmm. visit them? Or why not designate an evening of the week where they can, uh, you know, come together as a family. And he smiled at me and said, I know you Mormons. I know about your home teachers and your family home meeting, but here's the critical point. This was, this was in the 1980s. He said, it's too late. Mm. We needed that 20 years ago. And what you just said, see, that's just when those points of emphasis came in by these prophets and seers they gave us the answers before the problems. Before the wow. questions even. Yeah. Before yeah. the questions we would yeah. raise. Yeah. So it's not just a seer. That's, that's not bad to be a seer, but he's a, 
choice seer. Mm -hmm. Continue verse 7, if you will. Yea, Joseph truly said, Thus saith the Lord unto me, A choice seer will I raise up out of the fruit of thy loins, and he shall be esteemed highly among the fruit of thy loins. And unto him will I give commandment that he shall do a work for the fruit of thy loins, his brethren, which shall be of great worth unto them, even to the bringing of them to the knowledge of the covenants which I have made with my thy fathers. So that brings to mind, remember when we read in 1 Nephi 13 about the loss of not only plain and precious truths, but also many covenants of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that one of Joseph Smith's major functions will be to reestablish the concept of covenant, to establish what I call a covenant consciousness among the people. And covenant authority, which means priesthood and temples and all of that as well. Okay. And verse 8. And I will give unto him a commandment that he shall do none other work save the work which I shall command him. And I will make him great in mine eyes, for he shall do my work. He then goes on, interestingly, interestingly, and talks very briefly about Moses. If we were reading from the JST of Genesis 50, we'd get a lengthier treatment of Moses and even an inclusion of who Moses' uh, spokesman is, Aaron. But he, he's not concerned about Moses right now. He says, yeah, Moses is going to be raised up, but verse 11, a seer will be raised up. Um, Stan, read for us verse 11, if you will. <clears throat> but a seer will I raise up out of the fruit of thy loins, and unto him will I give power to bring forth my word unto the seed of thy loins, and not to bringing forth my word only, saith the Lord, but to the convincing them of my word, which shall have already gone forth among them. That is a very important verse. This idea that I'm not only going to raise up a choice seer, but I'll give power to him to bring my word forth to you. And that word's going to serve an interesting function or two. Not to the bringing forth my word only, but look what it'll do. What? Convince. What's it going to convince people of? Of the truths of the gospel. The truths of the gospel as contained in the Bible. Mm -hmm. The word that has already come forth. Yeah. And, and so, it's elaborated on in the next verse. This, that's right. The and how they'll Joe, grow Judah together. Compared to the record of Joseph. Remember that, that section 20 passage, verse 11, where the Lord says one of the major functions of the Book of Mormon, proving to the world that the Holy Scriptures are true. And even more here at the end of verse 12, if I could read here. The Why don't last you go ahead and read, Vic, verse 12, the whole thing. Okay. Uh, Wherefore the fruit of thy loins shall write. There's the. Book of Mormon. Okay. The fruit of the loins of Judah shall write. There's and the. And that which shall be written by the fruit of thy loins, and also that which shall be written by the fruit of the loins of Judah shall grow together. And then here's the, the, the purpose of them together. Unto the confounding of false doctrines and laying down of contentions and establishing peace among the fruit of thy loins, and bringing them to the knowledge of their fathers in the latter days, and also to the knowledge of my covenants, saith the Lord." You know, when you read the Ezekiel passage of, of chapter 37 about the two sticks, that's a marvelous prophecy. But I guess, I guess I'm prone to love this one a little more because it has more of a dynamic uh, flavor about it. These two records shall grow together and, and, and that, do that, this and this and this. And yeah. Explicit, yeah. It's yeah. very explicit as to yeah. what they're to do. It also says to me, as Elder Ballard suggested recently in General Conference, we ought to know the Bible. Now, we're prone to say, well, we're gonna, we need to study from the Restoration Scriptures. Yes, we should. But we ought to know the New Testament. We ought to know the Old Testament. Why? Because there are times, obviously there are times when modern revelation sheds light on, on ancient Scripture. But there are times when ancient scripture will shed a light on modern revelation. Oh, clearly. And the idea of them growing together to confound false doctrine, lay down contentions, establish peace, that's a dynamic relationship between the Bible and the Book of Mormon. You know, one thing that really draws me into this story, is, and I think we mentioned this earlier, that Joseph is here reading his mission. He, he's seen himself. And you wonder what he felt in 1830 and 33 when there were just a handful of followers. Here he has this vision of the world and the Bible and the Book of Mormon growing together. And he looks out at the branches and says, well, there are 150 followers or so. And <laughs> could, could he have imagined us at this table and, and now going out to get degrees in the New Testament or the Old Testament to understand the restoration? I mean, yeah. we're, we're literally a part of this. Little could he imagine 13 million people at that day. Do you remember the time that Elder Packer gave the conference address in which he discussed 
the new scriptures and their value to us. And he, he quoted this passage of scripture and, uh, and talked about how another way that they grow together is they simple, just look at our, at our triple combination or look at our Bible footnotes. And what do we see? We don't just see Bible things or we just don't see triple things. They're all blended together. Mm-hmm. And we just have a minute. Let's just note, he shall be called in verse 15, after me. Joseph and it, and shall be after the name of his father again. I just can't help but think what Junior, Joseph must yeah. have been feeling yeah. as he was translating this. Now, let's go over and notice. We've read verses uh, 17 and 18 in the past, 17 saying that Moses will have a spokesman for him, Aaron. 18, that we've usually read this as Joseph Smith will have a spokesman. Now, who are we talking about here? I assume somebody like a Sidney Rigdon. Sidney Rigdon and Oliver Cowdery were mm-hmm. both called. Section 28, Oliver Cowdery is appointed as a spokesman. Later in life, Sidney Rigdon becomes a spokesman. Could I suggest to you a second interpretation from this that Elder Bruce R. McConkie gave in uh, A New Witness for the Articles of Faith? And that's just, he reads it this way. He says, you know, he doesn't disagree with our traditional interpretations. He said, well, what if we read it this way? Verse 18. And the Lord said unto me also, I will raise up a man unto the fruit of thy loins, Mormon, and I will make for him a spokesman, Joseph Smith. And behold, I will give unto him, Mormon, that he shall write the writings of the fruit of thy loins, which is exactly what Mormon did, unto the fruit of thy loins and the spokesman of thy loins, Joseph Smith shall declare it. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. That's from a new witness for the Articles of Faith, page 425, 426. Hmm. Well, finally, let's just notice the the concluding verse that uh, we ought to notice, that verse 23, wherefore, because of this covenant thou art blessed, for thy seed, speaking to Joseph, thy seed shall not be destroyed, for they shall hearken unto the words of the book. And so we conclude with this, this, this deep appreciation for the coming, the call, the prophecies concerning the one, the great choice seer, Joseph Smith, and more particularly the saving power that will come through the Book of Mormon.